Hello, friends, and welcome to World Build with us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Daniel Quinn and Courtney Staples. On today's episode, we're taking just a little bit of a break from our previously scheduled prompt to do a little bit of a world building jam. But before we get into that jam, I would like to thank our newest patron, Orlando, for joining our Patreon. If you'd like to join our Patreon yourself, you can give us money over at patreon.com slash something or other. It's a, it's, you just click the link in the description where you can get early access to episodes, double the length for our patron listeners, access to our patron-only Discord chat, which is always fun, and all sorts of other goodies. Check that out in the link in the description. Now, uh, normally, we'd be finishing up a prompt from our world-building patron, Lord of All Chris's, but unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that this week. So, instead... We're going to be doing a good old-fashioned world-building jam. I'm very much looking forward to it. It's quite exciting. So the way the world-building jam works is that we're going to roll some dice. We're going to pick the genre, the theme, and the first thing that we're focusing on. And then uh, we're going to improvise a brand new world-building setting based on that information. We're going to do that a couple of times, roll some twists in between. And if that sounds really fun, guess what? It is. Every time we do a world building jam, we're always uh, just super excited. I almost said gas to the tits and I don't know why I said that. I am not feeling well, but that's what went through my brain. That's a, that's an odd saying, but <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why it went in my head, mm-hmm. but uh, I'm going to blame my illness for that. And we're going to keep moving. <laughs> that's fair. Remember that if you want us to build your world, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com. Click the link, follow the instructions, and within a reasonable amount of time, we'll be building your world. If you want to follow us on social media, you, I mean... You can follow us on Twitter if it's still not on fire by the time this comes Mm. out. Because boy, is that website on fire right now. Anyway, uh, more consistently, if you want to come and hang out and chat with us, you can come join our Discord where we are active and chatty. All that good stuff. There's a link for that in the description and I believe on our website as well. And as I said before, if you want to become a patron, there's a link for that in the description. Not going to go through that rigmarole again because I already went through it. Thanks to Orlando and a big thanks to Orlando and all of our patrons for their continued support. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and get right into a world building jam. So first up, we have to roll for the genre and our genre this time is... High fantasy. All right. With a theme of pain. Boy, I know that pretty well so Hmm. far. And then the thing that we're focusing on first is a moment of triumph. So we've got pain and a high fantasy setting focusing on a moment of triumph. Courtney, why don't you start us off? Hit us with your ideas. Um, as our resident lady of as, pain, yeah. I feel like this is kind of important that you would start us off this way. I'm just tossing it out there. I had a feeling you would be putting this my way. Um, I mean, come on. <laughs> it's literally in your wheelhouse. Why wouldn't I be? Yeah, I feel like we don't really do high fantasy a whole lot. So We kind of don't. We yeah. typically stick to fantasy, but not necessarily high fantasy. Because right. high fantasy to me is often very much just like... You're basically just doing superheroes in like a fantastical setting, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm like not sure where to go because I'm so not used to dealing with high fantasy. Um, mm. Elves popped into my head right away. So why? Why would elves pop into your head first? God. Fantasy, high fantasy, Lord of the Rings. I don't yeah, know. elves suck though, but you know whatever. <laughs> so elves and <laughs> um. So what is the moment of triumph and high fantasy and what? And the theme of pain. And pain. Yeah. All right. Well, if you're having some trouble, let's think about it. Why would pain be crucial to a moment of triumph? I suppose if we answer that question, that will get us a little bit closer to the setting itself. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, oftentimes in fighting in particular, you know, to, to overcome something, you go through a great deal of pain. Mm-hmm. And that triumph is usually warranted through the pain. Sure. But I feel like pain is like, pain is so specific that it has to be more than just like adversity. I don't think of pain being something that is, you know, like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Hold on. Hold on. Can we maybe do like a little bit of subversion stuff here where the moment of triumph causes a pain that is everlasting Mm. or something like that? So that way it's like, oh, it's a moment of their triumph. But at the same time, you're going to be reminded of this forever through some kind of semi-permanent pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the other thing we have to factor into that is high fantasy, too, because that kind of feels a little dark, right? All right. Sure. Sure. But that's but that's fine because even in high fantasy, there's like the dark gods that are also there, you know. So mm-hmm. it could be the ascension of a dark god. It doesn't. A moment of triumph doesn't mean a, a necessarily a moment of good, you know. So it could be the ascension of some kind of a dark elven god, and as a result, right, like each elf that's born is under a constant curse of pain or something like that. So, I mean, there's a number of ways that we can make this high fantasy include just a fuck ton of magic and a weird array of like forehead ridged, you know, like non-humans and, you know, like throw it in there. It, it, but, you know, just because it's dark doesn't mean it can't also be high fantasy. I want to toss that out. What, what I mean by that is like, and that's what you said, I think it's all true. But what I'm saying is like at the end of the day, high fantasy usually has something to say about good and evil. Sure. So we have to like... It has to take yeah. a stance, right? So I wonder if, that, if you're, what you're saying is what kicks it off then. Yeah. I was thinking something about like a god too. And what if it's like one god being splitting into two and that's this mm. moment of pain, but also triumph in some way. And maybe that is some sort of commentary on like the nature of good and evil and how I, um so I, I so I don't wanna I don't wanna discount that, but I wanna get this idea out there first. Okay, we can circle back. How do we feel about a false ascension? Like there is a Mm. heroic figure who ascends to godhood, but because they weren't supposed to be chosen or they're not worthy, they are racked in constant pain to the point where it is like debilitating to them in some way. And it might not even necessarily be godhood, but it might be like, oh, I ascended to a champion level status or something like that. I mean, like that that's another route that we can take with it as well. It could also be kind of the opposite where this ascension leads to the other gods feeling pain, where this like champion figure is sort of oblivious to that. Like basically his presence is changing their environment in some way that that causes them pain. And why would that be? Um, Like if you were saying like he's not, you know, worthy of the ascension, just something about his nature, like he's not pure of heart or whatever. Mm. There's an impurity in him that's sort of spreading to the others maybe what might be interesting there is you know maybe and this this could say something about the gods themselves in this way right we could have it so there's like the there is the the pantheon of good gods and they're from specific races they're humans they're elves they're dwarves they're god gnomes wow um yeah Yeah, something like that right and they're they're the pantheon they're the traditional like heroes and then like maybe there's an orcish hero who rises and he's a genuinely good person and they actually embody and are emblematic of they're a paragon of justice and like a universal truth but for some reason because they're an orc there's some kind of like underlying racism within the pantheon that literally causes them physical harm at the presence of them or mark of their nature you mean Something like that, right? Where, and I mean, thematically, what might be interesting about that is, um, you know, there is a discomfort and a pain that comes from like the traditional kind of established order, even though this is a God of good, this is a God of righteousness and justice and Mm -hmm. and, and expresses the justice in a way that is like most people would look at that and be like, no, yeah, they're traditionally good. Like a hundred percent, they are a paragon of virtue. 
Mm-hmm. Can can we? So I'm all on board with all the things you're talking about. Can we get away from gods though? Because I sure. feel like in high fantasy, it's so easy to like ascribe everything to the gods, and then it's all very black and white, and um, things get like de-reified because they're now gods. Can we mm-hmm. like make this pantheon like mortal beings? You know, like there's not really the gods yeah. involved in this situation. Perhaps some sort of fellowship that's trying to accomplish some task. <laughs> <laughs> or like, you know, like in our hero, maybe it's an ascended wizard, or maybe it's like, uh, I don't know, some kind of spiritual champion. But mm-hmm. just can we divorce the gods from the entire set? Sure. Yeah. Why don't we have it be like a council of heroes? But, you know, like yeah. what, ha- what yeah. happens essentially is... Uh, oh, we've got a, a hero from the non-traditional races who gets into this council. And then there is like a discomfort and a pain that arises from that kind of situation. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, that I'm fine with. I, I was just using gods because it's the easy way out. So I thank you, Daniel, for forcing us to do something yes. a yes. little bit less than easy. But yeah. <laughs> I just I just like, you know, like in any high fantasy, we always think about the gods. But like, what if they're just not part of the setting? That it's a different story to deal with. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. So let's let's talk about this. So what's the moment of triumph? Is it the moment of their heroic ascension? I would say so, because I, I kind of don't want the moment of triumph to be some like dramatic overcoming of racism all of a sudden where the the other heroes realize like the fault in their ways. I Oh no, I, I find the idea of like the pain being far more interesting yeah. if it's like a prolonged confrontation of like racism, <laughs> you, mm-hmm. you know, like. Well, could we say then, okay, so there's a council of some kind of heroes that are maybe very powerful, right? Can we say that when each person is added to this council, they share in their power collectively? And so by adding this uncommon kind of hero from maybe an unsavory race, in a sense, his power is shared among them and it changes them all. Oh, how mm-hmm. so? I like that idea. I don't know. Like maybe the nature of these heroes, the reason why they're all powerful is because they work in conjunction with each other. And each time they add someone, they all gain aspects of the person that's added. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, I could see, like you're saying, if it's an orc who's maybe traditionally from a species, maybe it's like the traditional fantasy orcs of Lord of the Rings where they are created of evil. And so like maybe this is a, a unique person who's different than them, but he still carries over their essence in a sense. Is one way to look at it. Not to say that's what we want to do. Yeah. yeah. Like I would like to try and move away from an essentialist argument when it comes to races and stuff like that. Um, but I like the concept of that. I like the idea that there is something within the, this like type of, uh, and mind you, when we say orc, orc can mean just about anything. So we, we should probably keep that interpretation open as well. You know what I mean? What we could do is, is this race actually created by the previously sentient or the, the sentient beings of this earth. And then maybe that's what it is. It's like, Oh, we don't know where our origins came from, but we may, it's like a homunculus, right? So you're at, you're allowing this kind of semi sentient or newly sentient uh, hero who is a homunculus among the collective. And then that is where that kind of difference starts to happen. You know what I mean? Oh, like, so almost if you were to think about it in sci-fi terms, like a robot who's gained thought and consciousness. Right, right. Like a sentient race of robots or something like that. But like, but it's been long enough now where it's like, oh yeah, we used to be that way, but we've gained sentience and now we're like our own thing. You know, like, I mean, the common kind of trope, if we were looking at it from a and d perspective, might be like the Warforged from Eberron or something like that. Or what was that uh, race recently? The one with D and D that caused a big issue. No, the Warforged from Eberron. No, or... no, 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 not that. The like uh, ape-like race. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Well, I mean that that was erased for a different. Re- I mean, like that was a very different thing that was going on there. But it's dramatically overblown. Like there, when you look at the actual details of that one, like they're they're relying on one particular art piece to make the entire argument, and it's really absurd. Yeah, but I mean, like the the kind. I mean, there's all sorts of. We're not going to get into that <laughs> fucking discussion right here. That's probably for an aphid lounge discussion at some <laughs> yeah. point. But like, I I actually mostly agree with you, Daniel. I do think it was kind of overblown in terms of like mm-hmm. what it's looked like. But I think it was mostly just like in response to 
you yeah, know, it's their like, PR response, which yeah. is the coast caving into anyone complaining about anything is basically what it is. Oh, well, no, no, no. I was thinking of something else. But a- anyway, no. let's let's move away from that and, <laughs> and continue to talk about the. So let's talk about this homunculus race then, I suppose. Right. So are you saying that these heroes in the past were originally constructed and now they're recruiting living sentient beings that aren't constructed? No, I'm I'm arguing the opposite, that. This council of heroes, the one that are all collective, actually, that might be a more interesting way to do it, Daniel. I think that might be more, mm. you know, like, oh, this is the first time a non construct has been added to this council. Mm. Oh, God, it hurts. Why are you hurting this so bad? You know, like that kind of thing. That is cool. I mean, oh. if you were doing it that way, you could talk about a, a difference between like, uh, law and chaos. And you don't even have to bring in the gods in that point. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of, you know, you have these beings who are inherently lawful and share like a collective ideal of law. And then you add in a, a living uh, thing and that thing is like causes chaos just by existing to that yeah. council, you know? Mm-hmm. I like the idea that um, it was some like created council of guardians or maybe they were created to make decisions for the betterment of all races or something to that effect and mm-hmm. kind of got like an iRobot vibe from that. Mm. I could see perhaps there was a particular person or wizard or whatever that created them and this person's gone or out of the picture. Mm. And so now they have to increase their numbers by what they know, but their decision-making is more like you're saying machine-like or rigid. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so to add, maybe they can't create more of themselves because that their creator is gone. So they choose a living hero who meets their qualities, but they realize like he's a person. And so he can be flawed in other ways. And that's what leads to part of their corruption. And that's kind of like, there is a desperation there, which is in itself kind of interesting because they're there. It suggests conflict right away. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really interesting on its face. And then we can even talk, uh, I mean, we can go a little bit further. And what I would like to do based on what we're talking about, we've been talking about this as a world, but if we're introducing this council, let's, let's really like rein it in. And this is either a small community. So I'm thinking like less than a nation or, or like at most a nation. Right. But I was thinking we could even have it just be a magical location. You know, like there is like a valley where it's basically we're getting into like uh, Logan's run, right? Uh, where it's like it's a small contained setting where the wisdom of the council cannot be questioned. And so when this new person gets added, it throws a whole bunch of shit into chaos. Does that make sense? I like the idea of keeping it to a smaller space, like a particular valley, yeah. a smaller community. Um the but question nothing else. Ask, Got it. Yeah. <laughs> the question <laughs> I would ask is, which is totally doable. How do we make it epic? I mean, we we we're okay. Um, well, because that's uh, a qualification of high fantasy. I mean, yes, right. Well, we're we're already introducing like magic. It's a magic city. Like we're basically mm-hmm. including that into this whole thing, right? Um, sure. Now, my go-to is to add in time magic in some way because I fucking love time magic. But but like, let's try not to do that and have it be like either a bubble city and uh, like we could have it flying city, underwater city, under magma city, something like that. It, the the mm-hmm. setting itself is the fantastical aspect that pushes it into high fantasy. I mean, can we go real weird? So like I'm sure. thinking this is an example of like a it's it, structurally it's not anything interesting but it's the meta stuff around it but so take the never ending story for example mm. you've got a fantasy landscape that's really the interior of a child's mind can we do something that's like one step beyond the fantasy setup so it's even weirder like it's like a, a figment of something or i don't know it's a bubble in the middle of a cosmos or it's a, it's a little gear in a larger mechanism or something that make kind of makes it feel like this small space is actually really responsible for something huge. I kind of like the idea of like a floating bubble in the cosmos. That's sort of, maybe it even gradually travels around to different worlds or something and interacts with them over long stretches of time. Mm-hmm. I like the idea of it being a cog in a larger cosmic machine. So maybe we can kind of thread those two things together 
mm-hmm. and give this city state some kind of cosmic importance kind of being like um it's like the hammer on a giant cosmic typewriter where it's just a single key press right but that key press actually really matters in the long run cuz it's like mm-hmm. I, I, again if i'm thinking of the never ending story where the artifice is kind of like a book then what I'm thinking here is this plays, this is like the A button in writing the literal fantasy of the universe (laughs) and just focusing that community on A, right? Or something like that. Something, I mean, if we're going ridiculous with it, then why not go truly ridiculous with it, you know? So if you want to merge the two, like you can say that it's a a cog or a mechanism that moves throughout the whole mm, coordinated like gated movement, you know? I was thinking... um, what if it's, you know, in fantasy stories, there are often omens that you see in the sky. What if it is that asteroid or comet that people see in the sky that triggers these like epic tales to come to pass? Can I tell you, I, I think that this is an inappropriate. To, well, <laughs> the conversation itself is going to be like kind of a tangent, but uh-huh. I have never used or liked the idea of prophecy in fantasy fucking Ever like the idea that preordained or predestined shit exists in fantasy is so goddamn frustrating to me. I have never wanted to even like glimpse in its direction. So really, I love prophecy. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, can you guys sell me on prophecy? Like, why do you mm-hmm. think it's fun or interesting or important? Um, I mean, so, I mean, I'm actually in a game I'm running. There is some prophecy involved. But usually what's fun about always in playing with prophecy is the prophecy is usually very vague um, and interpretable, like open to interpretation. And for the prophecy to be good, it can't spell out specifically the person's destiny. So really, I think the narrative move when you have prophecy is that the person leans into what the prophecy is suggesting, and there really isn't destiny involved. They're creating their destiny, Mm -hmm. but the prophecy is kind of suggesting a a path for them that they fall into. So like in the game that I'm running, there's a prophecy of the fall of the emperor and, um, the way in which it's suggested is vague enough that there's many ways that could happen, but just the idea that the emperor will fall sets in motion things narratively, like in the character's minds. And it's like, it's like a pull. I feel like it pulls you towards yeah. an end, even though it's not going to be that specific. end. if, if the story's good, obviously if the prophecy is like Bob will wake up on the 15th and have his head chopped off, nobody cares, right? That's <laughs> going to happen. So great. All the stakes are gone. But the idea is like kind of leaning into the mystery of how to interpret the prophecy, at least is what's interesting to me. Yeah. Like when, when thinking about this asteroid or comment or whatever, I'm seeing it as the catalyst, not necessarily like seeing this thing in the sky means exactly this, this, and this will happen, but more so like, when people see it, that will kick off a series of events. It's like a something that starts the action. Mm-hmm. So it's just like one piece in the puzzle, but it's like the first piece that you put down. Mm. So, okay, 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 okay. Daniel, we'll have a conversation about prophecy later because I have more <laughs> things to say about that. But I like what you just said, Courtney, because I love the idea that this community believes that it is making change, that it's instilling something in the universe just by its presence, just by like flying Mm -hmm. over. It's the omen maker, right? Something like that. And so, so with this in mind, does the council have some kind of morality to it? Right. So do they believe that by flying by at certain times or at flying by to make this change, that their duty is to make change? Or do they think that their overall plan is like, look, we don't care about what happens on the planets below. All I know is that our job is to fly over and like zoom low enough. So change happens or something like that. Mm. Because what's interesting about that kind of uh, dichotomy is that they are axiomatic about the way that they instill chaos in the world. Right. Because there's that Mm -hmm. kind of push and pull there. My sentiment is that these beings, since we describe them as being very methodical and maybe like they have kind of an axiomatic way of thinking, is that they don't, they're not interested in change and they're interested in keeping things in the order it's supposed to be. And they're watching over this community as being their purpose. Like, I'm assuming this herald or this prophetic sign is bad. 
like it means a change in things. So my feeling is like that's the catalyst for the story and what frightens them. And that's why they have to increase their number potentially. Can you explain that a little bit more? Can you, can you, uh, can you kind of unpack that a little bit more for me? Yeah, so I'm picturing if these are were originally kind of warforged esque sort of beings, like they're not natural, and some some wizard or someone created them to keep the order in this particular pocket world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they know that in terms of their philosophy, they're part of a larger mechanism, right? And their movements through the cosmos through the mechanism are how everything is in a line. Maybe they don't know or care about what the mechanism is, but they know they have to keep the balance in the way they manage it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm imagining a symbol like this, maybe it's an unexpected appearance of like a comet or something that's out of their charts of prediction. And they're like, oh, that's not supposed to happen. Like, what does this mean? And whatever accompanying prophecy suggests is just bad because it means change. But that inadvertently forces them to make a change because now maybe for whatever reason, they need to add someone to their number and they can't create more of themselves because their creator's gone. You know, maybe they bring that person to interpret the prophecy. I don't know. And that's kind of what kicks off the conflict in the story. Okay. 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 Hold on. Hold on. I I think I have an idea. You let me know how you think about this. So these beings are in charge of this community real quick. Do they know the importance of what they're doing? I'm almost inclined to say that they were given this task, but they don't quite Mm -hmm. understand the meaning or the implications behind it. And they just kind of robotically go about it. Okay. Agree. If that's the case, can we suggest or can we say that what their job – they're essentially piloting a massive city that is also what is essentially a starship, right? Mm-hmm. It's just a big fantastical starship powered by magic, mm-hmm. all that good stuff, right? Now, with that in mind, who makes the the star chart? Who plots the course to which – planet they travel to and from right maybe their creator was the one no it's the council the council of this they're charting the stars so they carry it out yeah yeah. right right and so if you have like lockstep hive mind like uh ideas of where to go and then all of a sudden you have a humanoid brain that's like actually we should go over here instead and it throws Mm -hmm. the whole thing out of chaos right like that to me is almost like is is also kind of interesting as well. Yeah, you know where it, like you add just a little bit of chaos, and all of a sudden things are happening. You know, what and I mean? what's what I what I like about that, and what Courtney was suggesting too, is that if if this sign, this omen, is the beginning of something chaotic that they're not certain of, they have been forced to introduce chaos to counteract it, right? Even though they don't realize that's what Ooh. they're doing. You know, mm-hmm. like even though they've been designed to create order, they realize, oh, we've lost our creator. We're mm-hmm. following the path. This new stars in the sky doesn't make any sense. What for whatever reason, maybe maybe the reason why they have to add more numbers is because their creator was killed or they were attacked and they lost some of their own number. And that's why they need to find more. I don't know. What I, I say I have a feeling that it, there's some malfeasance going on as well. <laughs> I like the idea that they're deliberately adding chaos, even though it makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. Because yeah. they have no other way to do it. Yeah. Right. Because they're like, we don't know. We literally cannot wrap our minds around how chaos works. So we're mm-hmm. forcing this kind of extra member in who doesn't know that they can't understand law the way that we, or yeah. like axiomatic stuff the way that we do. Mm-hmm. I like that. You can, if you know, I mean, we were talking about like orc or some other kind of strange species. Like, and mm-hmm. I saw, Courtney, you mentioned elves. We can have weird takes on elves, but what if there's like Ooh. a dichotomy of elves, not just like dark elf, light elf, but some kind of dichotomy. So like they're choosing among the chaotic elf rather than the mm-hmm. Yeah. Can, can we actually have it be elves as the council members and then yeah. like a non elf cool. as the new chaotic version of that? I think yeah. that'd be really fun to kind of mess around with that because again, I, I would like to stay away from like clockwork beings as this kind of hive yeah. mind. And if we keep these elves as super alien as like almost like beyond our comprehension. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That's so maybe it's fun. like the created elves versus the like the mortal elves or the the living elves, which are chaotic ones. Sure. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. There's like a more. I, I mean, I, I hate to get into like the divinity aspect of it again, but we are kind mm-hmm. of looking at these two planes of existence in terms of how we would perceive consciousness. Right. Like yeah. there is a stark difference between the elf. And whatever this hero has, you know, like who, who's ascended is, you know. 
I guess what's the question then is what are um what are our elves like? I mean, I think we already talked about the elves. I'm more interested in like how and why this new hero is like so important and or chaotic and like why that's necessary to the mission. Well, I'm wondering like when I hear elves, like I'm picturing your classic tall, white, thin eared, um, long haired. Are ours different than that? Like what's mm-hmm. the visual for the elves in general and then for these created ones? Because I think that'll answer your question about like how are the how is the addition different than them? Hmm. Well, remember, I'm I'm arguing that the that the new ascended part of the council is not elven at all. So let's let's hmm. talk about the elves, I suppose. Like, again, are we doing pointy ears? Let's start there. I would love to deconstruct an elf. Yeah. <laughs> A deconstructed elf. OK, mm-hmm. what does that look like to you, Daniel? Well, when I say deconstructed elf, I, I say like, well, what what do we typically think an elf is or means? And mm-hmm. then maybe we can subvert that. Mm-hmm. Well, for me, it's about how old they are. Like yeah. immor- immortality essentially is elven to me. And like mm-hmm. how willowy and whatnot. Their elegance, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. like whatever. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a fan of this nonsense anyway. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like, if we're going to subvert it, we got to we got to recognize what are the things that people see when they think yeah. elf, you know? No, no, no I, I like that. I like the way that we're doing that at the very least. Mm-hmm. But I think that uh, for sure, immortality is the thing that we should be focusing on primarily, you know, because I think that if these are immortal star guides, then that immortality really does matter, you know? Yeah, I would say immortality, like grace, um, a certain mm-hmm. like logic to them that I guess relates to their immortality and that they've like seen ages and ages of time pass. So they they view things a bit differently than we might. Yeah. Kind of like the Vulcans. They're a form of yeah. elf, like a pop form of elf. They're basically yeah. like fantasy Vulcans and mm-hmm. Vulcans are space elves. Yeah. They've even got the pointy ears. Yeah. It's fucking logic proof you can't get around that yep. yeah mm-hmm. absolutely so, so we're thinking kind of like immortal very rigid vulcan-esque elf is our take of the the yeah. created i mean fancy we could we could also just remove the word elf and call them fey as well or as well i mean That's, if yeah. we're in here because fey like to make bargains and if they're immortal willowy and like see things from a different perspective then the fae might be more appropriate than elves themselves you know what i mean i guess i see fae as having like ulterior motives and i don't mm. really see that with our our council members i mean tricksy kind of yeah you know. well like they seem very straightforward well with mm. the fae they have their own like um an axiom right like there's winter fae and there's summer fae they represent the seasons and nature within the seasons so why not have this other fay, this kind of council, represent a, a, a changing, right? Like it, that is what they represent is not winter or summer, but prophecy itself with all the trappings and, and all the weirdness that that kind of comes with. I feel like the hero that's being introduced isn't aware of his destiny or his power. Like I almost want to say like we, we have these, whether they're fay or high elves, we've got these like council of like logical star charter heroes right but then wherever this hero comes from i think he's just a normal person normally and he's Mm -hmm. been added on a normal person but you know like certainly a hero but like he's not aware of his destiny and so i wouldn't want to make him part of like an an antithesis to them because then it would be like they know what they're doing what do you mean by what do you mean by that daniel so like if i'm I'm right now you guys have described kind of this place where there's a valley where they all live or whatever it is, and it's floating through the cosmos machine. But there's a set council of heroes that were created by someone, and they're very logical, high elf, fey, kind of their own court unto themselves, right? And beneath them in the valley, someone is being added to them to become one of them because of all the stuff that's happening. But I feel like I'd rather that person be a fish out of water than someone who's like, oh, I'm aware of all the stuff that's going on. We are the mm-hmm. opposite of them. And so we have our own counts. I'd rather them to be kind of like, they're a bunch of wood elves, slack-jawed yokels in the background. And they pluck this guy and added him in. And now that's the chaos that gets caused because he doesn't understand their ways. <laughs> okay. Okay. I feel like what might help with this whole situation and give us a brand new perspective is if we rolled a twist. How do we feel about that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So 
the twist that we're dealing with is <laughs> now add something cute. Mm. I don't think this helped our no, situation in any way possible, <laughs> except we basically made like a Care Bears movie. Like that's basically where my brain is now going, right? Oh, wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Hear me out. What if this hero that is brand new and added is a child or a childlike being? Yeah, I like that. Because then mm-hmm. it builds in the, the what's na, the naivete? Is that the naivete? Of naivete? Naivete. I, see, I can never get that word. I have spelled it correctly all my life, but if I ever <laughs> say it, it's always doom for me. I mean, it's it's a weird looking word. It, to it be is fair. So weird. yeah, that's that's my a certain naivete in the child, which is built. In yeah, child. Yeah. This, yeah. Now I'm looking at this, and now I'm like, this is totally a fucking movie from the '80s, <laughs> a, akin to like Dragon Slayer, or like uh, if we're going a little bit later, maybe like Dragon Heart, you know. But mm-hmm. now add in a bunch of like Jim. Oh wait, it's like Labyrinth. That's what it's like. It's more like Labyrinth because yeah. I'm thinking like weirdo muppets and a bunch of like fantastical elements in that regard or or as you said daniel somehow foreshadowing a thing that we were not expecting the never-ending story you know (laughs) yeah Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) we got there damn it we looped all the way back around good job you conniving bastard that one's great too. Like, I don't know. I don't know how I would classify Labyrinth genre wise. I mean, I guess it's high fantasy, but it's more kind of a comedy. But the never ending story is absolutely high fantasy because it yes. has very dark themes of good and evil in this sure. sense. Like, the nothing and, and the wolf. I mean, I'm talking about the movie, of course. I don't, I haven't read the book. But in the, in the movie, of course, there is a very stark um, oblivion they're facing. And, you know, yes. like, mm-hmm. characters nothing. die that we love, you know? Yeah. Like, so I like I like that direction because there's still the possibility of humor and fun, but there's also a dark side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what does what does this ascension of a child to this council necessitate, and what does it suggest, and how is this a catalyst to be used in a bunch of stories? Let's kind of go from there. I mean, I imagine if we're kind of looping back to the theme of pain and the moment of triumph as a focus, like. I imagine that being chosen to serve on this council would mm. be like a great honor to whatever group that this child comes from, but also knowing that, you know, their child is being taken from them potentially forever to do some yeah. mysterious task that they don't understand. That's mm-hmm. going to be very painful. I, I was know. even going simpler than that, Courtney. I thought you were going to say something about the pain of growing up. You know? Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. Because like that is absolutely like a moment of tr- like everyone is excited to grow up until they do, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that already fits with what we've rolled so far. It's pain and a moment of triumph. So mm-hmm. that makes me wonder. Um, when you said that, Courtney, like the story could actually revolve around the parents, or you could run a story oh. that revolves around the parents oh. trying to get to their child. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. that's. See, now I'm in. Now I'm absolutely in. And now it's yeah. not about it's not about the city. Very small stakes, right? Yeah, the stakes are there. Mm-hmm. It's not about the city anymore. It's about the parents on their shitty little like yeah. wooden boat flying mm-hmm. from planet to planet, like just missing insane adversity, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, you yeah. could if you're writing this as a story, you could switch between the points of view. You could have the child encountering these very alien kind of beings and you can switch the main narrative of the parents and their Mm -hmm. journey. What you could also do, you could have it. So you watch all of these prophecies unfold, you know, like the, the prophecy ship flies over, you get a brief sense of what's going on down on the planet itself. The council does its thing unknowingly. And then the parents arrive as the prophecy is unfolding and you see what happened to that prophecy and how it was interpreted, you know, so you get to see both ends of the prophecy through varying perspective shots. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be- I like the idea too, of like having the parents as this very human like point of view, because yeah. previously it's like, uh, how do we, how do we tell like a, a really interesting story through these like, robotic elf people who are Mm -hmm. making these robotic decisions but having 
these parents who are like in pain, they're experiencing pain. They, they have this really set goal in mind that brings it mm. to a new level, I think. Yeah, that Daniel, you saved it. That was yeah, that's absolutely yeah. a fucking way to do <laughs> well, it. Courtney's that's the great. one who suggested. I was like, wait a minute. She said that. I'm like, I could see that. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, no. Okay. Well, we all saved it. Okay. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> oh man. Okay. I think that's super fun. Like, what a great setting to explore. And it's funny. It's seeing the chain of how that worked, right? Like, it started with yeah. you suggesting the child, right? Because the cute led to the child, and the child led to the parents. And I feel like. Each of our moves there, if you're thinking about like the world building moves, like that's how it adds up. That's a good yeah. example of how it works, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. We all build off of each other. And that's mm-hmm. the best thing about that. Like the collaborative aspect, as you all know from listening yes. to a hundred and some odd goddamn episodes of our show, like that's the thing that I love the most is when we really come together and it's like, oh yeah, it's better than yeah. the sum of its parts, you know? Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. I think we've got enough time for another world building jam session because that one went kind of long. We kind of like took our time. We we kind of like poked and prodded and figured out where we wanted to go with it. I think we've got time for about one more. What do you think? Yeah, I'd say so. All right, bet. Let's go. Uh, so again, we're rolling some dice randomly, obviously, because that's how dice work. I mean, most dice anyway. So this time, the genre that we're going to be working with is... Paranormal romance. Hell yes. Mm. Very excited already. The theme of this paranormal romance would be the mundane. Interesting. And the first thing that we're focusing on in this paranormal romance is someone really important to the setting. But I think that's appropriate considering the romance angle. So, yeah. Um, let's see. I forced Courtney to kind of start us off last time. Daniel, as our resident expert in paranormal romance, why don't you get us start <laughs> us off here? Where are you thinking? The tricky thing I think that, that we're going to be focusing on here is the mundane aspect, because if it's yeah. paranormal romance, how can it also be mundane? Mm-hmm. What are you thinking? I mean, uh, so let me just, to my background in paranormal romance, I don't know, does, um, does Twilight count as paranormal yes. romance? Okay. That's exactly okay. right, Daniel. Yes. I was sadly forced to watch two of those films, and Ouch. I will never get my life back. From Which two? Out. The first two of those movies. Mm. Gotcha. They were yeah. So awful. Those movies are dog shit. Anyway, yeah, I'm not a fan. So bad, my condolences. So yeah. I mean, oh, I can't imagine someone reading that. So <laughs> I, for some reason, you fucking shade so much. <laughs> I can't. Um, so. The, for some reason, what springs to mind is an, an anime, surprisingly. Wow. Um, Who what? are you? Called what have Lane, you done with Daniel? Called Lane Serial Experiments. Wait, wait, <laughs> wait. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We need to stop the show for just a moment here. Daniel is suggesting something based on an anime. Um, yeah. There's a few animes I like, just a few. This is like, this is like what, if I was like, you know what we should do? We should add dwarves Dwarves. to this. Like that's, this is like an anti-bingo card move that you're making here, Daniel. That's why. That's what I'm here for. It's like the the comet of prophecy has flown above and yeah, just totally exactly. flipped things yeah. upside down. No, no, Daniel, no. The child just entered Daniel's council and like, he's now adding chaos that to this. Child. Kill that child. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> So, so in, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't really remember anything about Lane Serial Experiments other than like the design of it and like how spooky it kind of was. But my thought is, if we want to combine the mundane with paranormal, what if the basis of this is um, an internet ghost? And mm-hmm. the way this is set up is that it happens through technology, and it has to do with communicating with some kind of love thing digitally. Okay, so you're talking about a daemon, basically, right? Yeah, something like that. Or some something I'm picturing the fuzz on the TV screen in the computer monitor and the headset and the person in the dark mm-hmm. room talking to that person through this digital space. Mm. Uh, what comes to mind right away with mundane and what you're saying with static is the idea of like a call center for directing ghosts to different parts of the afterlife. And like at some <laughs> point, one of the ghosts and one of the one of the call center employees kick it off well. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's super cute, actually. I mean, I don't know how to deal with the focus of someone important to the setting, but uh, yeah, that can come. 
What? So it's a call. I said that can come eventually. It's not a oh, big deal. I thought you said I can come, and I'm like, hey, no. <laughs> no. I'm pretty sure we get banned for that shit. <laughs> um, I, I think, um, I think it's cool because you've built in the setting already. So we've got like a kind of a junk, uh, uh, an old style operator junction for spirits, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's mundane because you know it's a, it's like the severance. It's like an office space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I suppose we have to answer the question: Who's the, who's the one who falls in love with whom? Mm. Because if it's a ghost who falls in love with a, a director, that's very different than the director who falls in love with the ghost. I think it's got to be the um, person doing the directing because who falls in love with the ghost? Yeah, because they okay. have information about this ghost and they've spent time processing them potentially. Mm. Mm. The ghost is passing through, you know. I'm I'm thinking of this scene where she sends the ghost somewhere and then shows up at that place as well. Something like that. Just to like watch them work or maybe fall in love with them a little bit, or maybe like that's the ending where she's like, Okay, I'm quitting my job. And, you know, like I'm quitting my job so I can be with you because I can't direct you and also whatever at the same time, something like that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, okay. Wait, are they both ghosts then? Or is this person just like knows ghosts exist and directs them in particular ways? Like, how does that work? I mean, I think you're suggesting this is a corporation, right? Courtney, mm -hmm. like, yeah, uh, it makes me think that this is like, perhaps this is in the near future where we've learned how to direct people to the afterlife and process them in some way. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, so this is like fairy man or like fairy, right? Mm -hmm. Like F E R R Y or, or wait, okay, hold on. It would have to be something where there's no E R at the end of this. Cause it's a tech startup, right? <laughs> dot, dot AI. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Fairy dot AI. Yeah. Oh no, it's ferryman, but with no a. So it's, it's, it's car, car on dot, dot car on. Car on. Yeah. On. <laughs> no, no, it, that would be like C H R N. There's no yeah, A or yeah, O. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's something dumb. It's something yeah, dumb so like dumb. that. Yeah, I love mm -hmm. it. Um, oh, you mean Cron? No, no, no. Car it's yeah. it's Caron. It's, Karen. it's definitely <laughs> Caron. No, but it's C H R N. You know, like who? Kn you know. <laughs> oh my god, it's so true. But yeah, yeah, I was picturing like it's a call center full of mortal people who have mm -hmm. been chosen to like direct the ghosts uh -huh. in there. I don't know if it's directing them to the afterlife so or... this is patrick swayze ghost but with like <laughs> more corporate and like yeah. phone call stuff going on okay yeah. gotcha gotcha um how do they date oh definitely text chat discord obviously um, text emails chat. yeah yeah emails mm -hmm. i mean it seems like the complication is that this person on the call center side Maybe they know there's a way to direct them back to the living and that's where mm -hmm. their job is in the problem interesting you're not allowed to well, do that because that's real bad are these spirits even allowed to like exist in one of the two planes or are they purely interstitial beings because if you're able to travel back and forth from land of the living land of the dead you it know it seems like i mean it's, it seems like they would be in transit right and maybe they're like in a waiting room to be processed or like mm -hmm. there's some it takes some length of time otherwise we wouldn't be able to have the operator have communications with them so i'm wondering mm -hmm. if like maybe there is technically a way to do that you're not it's not supposed to happen and it's a well-guarded corporate secret and that's kind of the thing that this person is willing to take a risk mm -hmm. you know to do that you know there's a scene towards the end the manager's like you really think it's worth it like this or you you really think this is worth all of that Mm -hmm. you don't even know if they're actually going to show up. And it's like, I do. And they walk through the door and there's at first there's nothing. And then somebody appears or something yeah. like that. That's, that's mm -hmm. the trope. That's the moment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Courtney, you're, you're sending a gif in the chat of the Beetlejuice wait waiting staff room. and like the waiting yeah. room. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's gotta be that. part of it. Right. Yeah. Just that very like tedious kind of corporate feel. Mm -hmm. And it's just mm -hmm. ghosts waiting around to be told what to do. Oh, because there's two perspectives to that. That's kind of mm -hmm. neat if you want to do yeah. it that way. You can have on one side of the glass, there's the call operator and their boring, mundane existence. On the other side, it's the Beetlejuice Elf's kind of like spiritual realm that they're waiting in. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Hold on, hold on. The two perspectives things helps a lot, right? Imagine that you want to go back into that waiting, into that waiting room. You know, it's like, 
every time I get to go back and wait forever, yeah. I at least get to talk to that person. Yes. So mm-hmm. like, like their caseworker kind of. Yeah. Like maybe the first couple of haunts, it's like, Oh, this is awful. But then after like the third or the fourth or whatever, you start to develop this kind of relationship or something like that. Oh, that that might be kind of interesting. That's how we do it. It's like in, um, what's that, the show I love? Um, it has, uh, Raised by wolves. okay. It's got, <laughs> Close. It's got the okay. It's got the guy who said Enigma Montoya, "I am your father." What's that actor? Or uh, you killed my father, Ma- Mandy Patinkin. My wife just said. So in, uh, what is that with the show though? Thank you, Mandy Daniel's Patinkin's wife. <laughs> Mandy Patinkin's in it, and it's, they're they're Grim Reapers. Um, dead like me. Dead That's like me. Show. Yeah. So uh, it makes yeah. me think like if it's a case working situation, then I wonder like maybe the way this is set up is like they have to do a number of things to pass on so maybe like certain hauntings or whatever and that's why they can keep coming back to this waiting room because it's when you get reprocessed and caseworker talks to you and see if you're prepared to go to move on right mm-hmm. oh, so that's, that's they good. keep going back to haunt into the world until they're ready to move on and they fall in love with the caseworker or vice versa and they d- and they don't want to move on because it's yeah. yes. breaking yeah. up. So like mm-hmm. maybe maybe that's part of it is that they're forced to continue to do this kind of job that they don't really like, yeah. but it means being with the one that they love. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like how we're, I like what we're doing here. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. A rare uh, Daniel's wife cameo, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> she just yelled Mandy Patinkin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, She's man. used to me just like saying, there's that show with this guy. He has eyes. <laughs> yeah. He's Honestly, lot. Daniel, you joke, but that's basically what that you is, do. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's all I got. There's this guy who's wearing a shirt. Yeah. That's yeah. The show. And then one of you guesses it exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Courtney, Courtney, what's that show I like? You know the one. <laughs> that, that one, that single. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's got the guy. Yeah. Know. With the face. Yeah, yeah. It's a book. There's words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Daniel, yeah. The shows Daniel knows are like X Files and Raised yeah. by Wolves and literally Isn't nothing there. else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Oh, and Star Trek. Star Trek. Sorry. Star Trek. Same Star Trek. Music. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this is a very cute story that we've arranged here. Mm-hmm. And let's see if we can maybe invoke the blood god or something like that <laughs> and figure out how that works. Uh, let's roll for the twist and figure it out. So our twist this time is change the genre. No, (laughs) no, I don't want, we just had a cute little romance story. No, No. I love it. Let's do it. Let's do it. What genre (sighs) are we going to change it to? Does it give us a random thing? Yes. We're going to reroll the genre. Okay. Okay. So the genre now is a space Western. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yes <laughs> it's so um, random i love it so this is all taking place on a space station mm-hmm. <laughs> well, wait, wait 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 hold on hold on we can still keep the romance angle yeah. we can yeah, still yeah. keep this kind of like oh these two kind of lovers who are like in this kind of mundane relationship where they're both semi-trapped right mm-hmm. where they keep doing the thing so they can keep seeing each other right yeah. it's just that the one of them isn't a ghost mm-hmm. anymore so that's all we can do right that right part. but if- now instead it's like now i'm gonna and now i've got to stay being like a space coal miner essentially <laughs> right like something like that where it's like i've got to continue to do this job just so i can continue to see the love of my life that kind of thing I think if we keep those elements, this still works. How do we make it a space Western, though? Oh, I mean, I was going to say that it could still be a ghost, just a space ghost. That's well, true. Ghost could in be a space. space ghost. From coast to coast? A space yeah, ghost. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm neither here nor there. I could do either one. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. uh, I mean, could we take a ghost metaphorically? Because in the Westerns, there's a lot of characters who are transient and they're essentially mm-hmm. ghosts. Like they might as well be dead because they're so not part of society and moving in and out. I'm thinking, okay, so now the startup is called Ghost with no O. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that the call board operator thing can now work, right? Like that kind of level of thing. And maybe the, yeah, this can Telegrams. still work. We, we can mm-hmm. still make this happen. Oh, can the call operator be 
like someone who has to deliver messages on horseback, like a, yes, like a postman or a yes. telegram person. Yes. Well, I, again, there's space travel. Why would they have horses? Well, space work. Because serenity. <laughs> <laughs> because they got to get off the spaceship. And once they get off the spaceship, they're in this no man's land with an EMP shield. And they got to take their horses to get there. But they still have laser oh, guns because okay. they want the laser guns to work. Okay, 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 okay. So the this space cowboy, right? Their job is not – it's basically to ferry people from – spaceship to wherever they need to go and they did that once for this one person who they're now in love with right like they Mm -hmm. like imagine the long journey she's got his hands wrapped around his waist her head on his shoulder they fall in love but he doesn't have to take her back ever or something like that and so he's very excited every time he makes it out to that small town or something like that or he keeps Mm -hmm. traveling through that one particular area I don't know. I'm just tossing this out there. I feel like there's something interesting with this, though. So he's like, a, he is a fairy man. He normally delivers people, right? That's what we're right. saying. And he's made a delivery in the past, but along the way of that journey, he fell in love with the delivery. Okay, wait a minute. Space Western, why isn't this person a bounty hunter? Oh, uh, yeah, I was just thinking Ooh, that. And yeah. this, this was actually a, a bounty, but he obviously fell in love and couldn't. Oh, and that and that adds to the that adds the to the romance angle. That adds to the forbidden romance angle. At that, mm-hmm. like, oh man, you Mando. Made... We just recreated Mando. Did we? Yeah, with Baby Yoda. He <laughs> loves Baby Yoda. He he was supposed to be a bounty hunter. Not even wrong. <laughs> I know. And he went back and got him. I mean, you're not wrong, but it's weird because there's no. <laughs> This is far more r- romantic in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, that yeah. was platonic kind of parent love, but this is more like romantic, right? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, we could go through all the different Greek types of love, right? Like, why not? <laughs> oh, yeah. God. No, 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 not that kind, Daniel. Not the pederasty. <laughs> no. That's where I no. thought we were going. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. no. Abort, there, abort. There's different types of love in Greek culture where it's like, there's work love where you there sure work, are. Yeah. <laughs> God damn it, Daniel. <laughs> this podcast does not condone that kind of Greek love. God damn it. <laughs> uh, okay. You know what? Sure. We made fucking Mando for the second setting. You sons of bitches. Whatever. We did it. We got there. It's exciting <laughs> and fun. Fucking Jesus. This has been world build with us, I guess. Um, <laughs> if you want us to build your world go to our website worldbuildless.com click the link follow the instructions don't give us mando again please like whatever Andor's it's pretty fun. good i was surprised mando is good yeah that's true i, I haven't seen the second season oh i mean andor whatever. i haven't seen any of it oh really yeah. Yeah. yeah andor's good it's actually good i was shocked wow Mm-hmm. It, that's genuinely surprising to me, especially coming <laughs> yeah. from you. So mm-hmm. I hated that. Uh, what's the one where he he dies in the end? Boba Fett. The, the, <laughs> no, the movie with the Andor guy. Like, oh, I Boba didn't care Fett. about that movie. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> the one with the with the, it's, uh, the it's getting the plans the Death Star and then oh um oh I know what you're talking about Boba Fett yeah, yeah right oh, God damn it <laughs> <laughs> no it's Rogue One you're talking about Rogue that's One it. Yeah. yeah yeah I didn't like that movie but I like Andor <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right you know what yeah this has been world build with us uh go to our twitter if it's not dead by then uh realistically what you want to do is come to our discord come chat with us about all sorts of fun stuff uh right. and you know if you want to give money to us on patreon like our newest patron orlando again big thanks to you you can do that go ahead and do that why not right who cares in the meantime though thanks for this small and fun little divergent jam that we had Remember that we love you very much and we're going to get through this together until next week. 